Carlos Ruggillo. I'm chief of the MRI unit at Garajan Hospital in Buenos Aires, Argentina. Thank you for the invitation. It's an honor to participate in these webinars. My topic today will be spinal infections in Latin America. I have no disclosures regarding this presentation. As you know, Latin America is a large region. We are around 660 million people, and that represents around 8.42% of the total world population. We have several problems here. One of the worst is poverty. You can see here poverty rates in different of our countries. And at the same time, we have a relatively young population. You can find here large fashionable cities as Buenos Aires or Sao Paulo, alongside large shanty towns that are overcrowded because inequality is one of other of our worst problems. And these two things represent uh, breeding ground for infections. You know that uh, we have endemic areas for certain infect infections and infestations, but in our globalized world, bugs can travel with us from one place to another, so we can find these uh, infections all around the world. Let me tell you some things about pediatric spondylodiscitis. The intervertebral disc in children is relatively vascularized in comparison with adults. You can see here in this graph on the left, the gray areas represent the vascularization of the disc space in children. Um, on top of this, the, the lumbar region is the most frequently affected in children. The root of infection tends to be hematogenous um, the, sometimes we don't find etiology and the diagnosis tend to be delayed. The most frequently found germ is staph aureus, but in younger children, especially between the ages of six months and two or three years, Kingella kingi is very frequently found. Let's go to images. Here we have on the left uh, an 18 month uh, old male with fever and inflammatory markers. And we found this uh, narrowing of the fifth disc space with which has uh, hypointense signal on stir, which is uh, different uh, from what we find in adults in infections. Um, we find, as you know, hyperintensity of the disc. Here you have the axial T1 with GAD, and we find this tissue surrounding the disc space with a relatively homogeneous enhancement, and uh, we call this phlegmonous tissue. And this is the axial T2 with a hyperintensity, especially at the posterolateral margin. Um, these uh, tend, uh, tend to be uh, Kingella kingi discitis. You know that Kingella kingi is a uh, coco bacillus that is uh, difficult to grow. So uh, sometimes we don't find this ideology, but it is uh, a relatively frequently uh, cause of infections in young children. Here we have another pattern. This is a seven year old female with chronic back pain. And you can see the hypointensity on T1, uh, very homogeneous of both continuous vertebral, vertebral bodies with this tissue in the anterior epidural space, which is hyperintense on STIR and hypointense on T1. And the heterogeneous pattern of enhancement with a relatively hypointense area in the middle, which is an abscess. So you can see the difference between abscesses and phlegmous tissue. Abscesses are important because if they are large, they may be uh, susceptible to surgical uh, treatment. And this was a staph aureus spondylodiscitis. Here you have a 15 year old boy with back pain. You can see several lesions in, in some vertebral bodies. Uh, 
we skip some of them. They are very well um, defined on STIR. They are hyper intense, uh, relatively hyper intense on T1, and they uh, have a peripheral pattern of enhancement. You can see on the axial images, the presence of this uh, extension to the paraspinal space and the presence of uh, collections in this uh, tissue. You can think of meds, or you can think of some other diagnosis, but in our countries, tuberculosis is one of the most frequently found ideology of these images in children. Uh, you, can, you know that the paradigm of tuberculosis is the presence of this structure, which is the granuloma. It's a complex structure that in the past, uh, we used to think that it is like a wall of uh, the dissemination of the bacteria, but now uh, we know that in some cases it's, um, on the contrary, it is a favorable uh, media to the propagation of the infection from one macrophage to another. Another case, a 14-year-old boy with chronic lumbar pain and repetitive kidney infections. And here you have a very large collection in the abdomen and pelvis on the right side, which uh, has an extension into the vertebral body and the compromise of the disc space. And it's important that on ADC sequence, the it has a hyper intense signal intensity. So there is facilitation of diffusion. Um, so we wonder if it could be a bacterial abscess, but this was relatively unexpected for a biogenic abscess. And it turned out to be, again, tuberculosis. And finally, I would like to show you uh, this case. This is a 13 year old boy with COVID-19 infection and breakthrough craniospinal infection. Here you have these granulomas at the uh, cervical medullary junction uh, with the typical hypointense signal on T2 and this ring-like enhancement with a, with a very thick pattern. Uh, some granulomas in the brain with edema and in the spinal cord, we can see the, the collapse of some vertebral bodies and this prevertebral collection, uh, which is septated, and this fusiform, very typical of tuberculosis. So um, I show you this because COVID-19 uh, is uh, can trigger uh, a more um, aggressive form of tuberculosis, and this is very well uh, determined in the literature. So tuberculous spondylitis is a, has a high prevalence in our countries. The incidence is on the rise. It predominates in the thoracolumbar spine. And many times we don't find pulmonary lesions uh, that occurs in 15% of cases. The, the presentation, the clinical presentation uh, tends to be insidious and subacute. Um, the, characteristics, the typical characteristics are the presence of paraspinal abscesses, the compromise of the bone more than the disc, the subligamentous dissemination, um, multiple levels um, of infection, and spinal deformation. You know, the Hibas deformity, uh, which is very well known, and I like to show you this a uh, mummy, Egyptian mummy from the 21st dynasty, around 1000 years before Christ, that shows this uh, pot disease. So this bug has been with us for a while. Here you have a 65 year old male from a rural area with chronic back pain. Uh, and you can see on this uh, sagittal reformation of a CT scan, the presence of uh, like degenerative changes, um, bony spurs, and but on axial, you can see that there is a very 
um, marked changes, osteolytic and osteoblastic at this level. We did an MR and now you see the very large compromise of two adjacent vertebral bodies with uh, hypointense signal intensity on T1, relatively diffuse hyperintensity on STIR, some restriction, especially at the level of the epidural um, um, tissue, and the, the extension of this process to the perivertebral space. Uh, you can think of a spondylosis because of these spurs, but this case was brucellosis. Brucellosis is caused by Brucella militensis, which is a gram-negative coccobacillus. Uh, it has two forms. One is the focal with erosions and sclerosis in vertebral bodies, especially at the ends plates, and changes of inflammation at scintigraphy or MRI and relatively preserved discs. We have uh, the diffuse form, which is uh, um, represented by osteomyelitis of neighboring vertebrae, involvement of the intervene, intervening disc, and may have extradural infection without bone destruction. But the key findings of this infection is the relatively preservation of the vertebral architecture the homogeneous signal intensity that is different than TB, the presence of large osteophytes, parodbics, in association with destruction and sclerosis, and sometimes we find the associated sacroiliitis, which is very typical of this infection. And the, the, the root or the way of um, contagious is the consuming of dairy products made from unpasteurized milk. Another case, here we have a 30-year-old male with low back pain, and you can see here this uh, hyperintense, spontaneously hyperintense lesion uh, in L4 vertebral body with relatively mild enhancement. And this is the pattern on stir with a heterogeneous pattern. And um, you can think of uh, hemangiolipoma in this case, but it turned out to be osteitis by Bartonella. Another case, this is a 10-year-old girl with a cutaneous dorsal skin lesion and upper dorsal pain. And you see here the collapse of the T4 thoracic vertebral body and the presence of an inflammation, uh, diffuse inflammation at the skin and subcutaneous tissue, and the presence of this enhancement tissue in the dorsal epidural space. Um, here you can see the hyperintensity of the collapsed vertebral body, this perivertebral tissue, uh, which is a phlegmonous tissue, and the presence of these lesions at the level of the upper femurs. And this uh, might uh, seem similar to LCH, Langerhans cell histiocytosis, but it turned out to be again Bartonella. Bartonella henslea is a small fastidious aerobic facultative intracellular gram negative that targets red blood cells. Uh, you know the cat scratch disease, but this is uh, may be complicated uh, with a disseminated form which is called a disseminated Bartonellosis. And, um, the history of skin lesion, lymphadenopathy, and hepatosplenomegaly are, is very useful. Uh, it is rare, but sometimes we can find this osteitis with our granulomas that surrounded macrophages that contained uh, Bartonella. The diagnosis sometimes is difficult, but PCR is very helpful in biopsy specimens. This is a 25-year-old male from Bolivia with chronic back pain and spastic paraparesis. And you can see here these cyst-like structures in the intradural extramedullary space that compress the spinal cord and this uh, may seem similar to aseptic arachnoiditis or disseminated tumor, but uh, 
in the lumbar spine, we see again another cystic process with these typical small nodules at the periphery of the cyst. Um, the compression, the eccentric, eccentric compression of the cora equina roots. And this was a case of neurocysticercosis. You know that the leptomeningeal form of cysticercosis occurs six to eight times more often than the intermedullary form. Neurocysticercosis is very frequent in many of our countries. Uh, remember that uh, cysticercosis have um, two cycles. Um, this, the, the normal cycle is the teniasis, the tenia solium that goes from humans to, to pigs and we get the infection by uh, consuming uh, pork meat, which is not completely uh, cooked. But there is a second way, the aberrant transmission way, uh, which produces human cysticercosis. In this, um, in this cycle, uh, human get the infection, but uh, the, there is no uh, growing of the larvae, the larvae goes to the cysticerci um, form, which is a, a stage of the larva that can uh, localized in many tissues, including the central nervous system. Uh, we have two forms, basically, the cysticercus cellulosi, uh, which has a scolex and is uh, located intraaxial, and the cysticercus racemosi, which lacks a scolex in general, and it is usually located in the subarachnoid space, as we saw in our case. And it, it produces like a gray black clusters pattern. And these are the stages of the intraaxial uh, lesion that are very well uh, known. Let's go to another case. This is an 18 year old female from Patagonia, Argentina with chronic low back pain and sphincter dysfunction. Um, here you have a very huge lesion at the lumbar and sacral area of the spine. Uh, it is mostly cystic, but it has the peculiarity to have uh, many small vesicles inside this large um, cyst that goes all the way up to the L1, L2 uh, level. Um, on axial, you can see again this uh, funny pattern that may resemble uh, ABC, for example, a primary bone tumor, but it turned out, turned out to be echinococcosis. Echinococcosis is uh, caused by echinococcus granulosums. Uh, it's uh, produced by the larval stage of this um, parasite. You know that the definite host of this parasite is the dog and the intermediate host is the sheep. Um, but we humans are accidental hosts. Um, we get the infection by the consumption of food or water contaminated by eggs of the parasite. Um, the vertebral uh, localization represents 50% of the skeletal form of the disease. Uh, it most frequently involves the thoracic segments. Uh, the growing patterns tends to be non-spherical as in the brain because of the rigid uh, structure of, of the spine. And there is microvesiculation, which is very typical of this process. Um, you have uh, compression, ischemia, and osteoclastic proliferation in this process. Let's go to this patient. This is a three-year-old girl with subacute development of paraparesis and upper limb tremor followed by encephalopathy. This is a typical case of ADEM. Uh, you have many uh, wild matter lesions in the brain, in the um, brainstem and cerebellum without mass effect. Alongside with this uh, myelitis, uh, longitudinally extended myelitis with some enlargement of the conus medullaris. Well, in general, we don't find uh, 
a, a gem etiology of this uh, process. Many times we find antibodies, for example, again against anti against mock uh, protein. But in this case, we found toxocariasis. Toxocara catis and canis are the etiology of this um, immunological response. Um, the definite host are cats and dogs. Um, we have uh, the larvae by hematogenous dissemination. And the, this larvae can't mature in, in humans, so um, they start to migrate all around the body. This is the, the larva migrants. Um, and sometimes they insist in some localization as the brain or the spine. Um, the, the production of uh, an inflammation uh, may trigger an immunological reaction that may be uh, due to the freedom of, of some autoantigens or by molecular mimicry. In all these infestations, the presence of hyper eosinophilia is a very good uh, lab uh, friend for the diagnosis of this disorders. Now let me show you this case. This is a 45-year-old male from Misiones province of Argentina. You can see here the chest uh, x-ray with this uh, very uh, huge infiltration in both lungs. Alongside, we found this uh, mass lesion in the left parietal lobe which is spontaneously hyperdense on CT, is hyperintense on T1 with a peripheral enhancement pattern, and it is markedly hypointense on T2, which is very typical of granulomas. We found this uh, nodule in the cervical spinal cord, which is again hypointense on T2 and surrounded by edema. And we thought about TB, but uh, it turned out to be paracoxidiodiomycosis. Paracoxidiodiomycosis is very frequent in certain areas of Brazil and the north of Argentina. Uh, this is a fungus which is dimorphic. It has a mold and yeast uh, forms. Uh, the mechanism of spreading is the inhalation of the fungus from contaminated soil. And there is no contagious from one human to another. And it, it, the, the infection tends to, to be uh, present in immunosuppressant uh, conditions that uh, take to immunosuppression as HIV, for example. And here you have the, um, the fungus uh, and the two forms of this uh, germ. Another case, this is a 30-year-old male from Sao Paulo with HIV and cervical, um, compromised with irradiation to both upper limbs. And you can see here the presence of this small lesion in the posterolateral uh, aspect of the medulla, alongside with this myelitis. Uh, this myelitis has uh, some heterogeneous enhancement um, it is like an aiding pattern, but we can think of infectious. Um, it turned out to be Chagas disease. Chagas disease is caused by the American trypanosoma, the trypanosoma cruzi. Uh, the transmission is by the triatomine uh, family, uh, the kissing bugs, which uh, we call them here vinchuca. This uh, vinchuca is an arthropod that in infested humans by defecation in the site of its bites. And it has uh, four uh, forms, this, this disease in humans, the acute one, which is very frequently find, found in children, the acute reactivation, which is the most frequent, uh, especially in immune, under immunosuppression, and it produces a multifocal nodular encephalitis, especially affecting white matter. The chronic 
form uh, and the cardiovascular complications, especially the cardioembolic stroke. The diagnosis is made by serology and CSF test for Chiparansoma cruzi and histologic examination. Here you have two cases. On the left, a 16-year-old male with cervical pain, fever, and progressive tetraparesis. And um, you can see here this huge cervical medullary lesion uh, with an myelitis, ex longitudinally extended myelitis, and this uh, pattern of enhancement, especially at the dorsal aspect of the spinal cord. Um, and we thought about sarcoidosis because of this sub pio enhancement pattern. On the right, you have a 19-year-old female with lumbar pain, lower limbs, parathesias, bladder and intestinal dysfunction, and sexual impotence. Uh, and you can see here the presence again of uh, myelitis at the caudal uh, segment of the spinal cord with this mild enhancement. Um, we thought about anti-mog in this patient, but both tend to be schistosomiasis. Schistosomiasis is caused by schistosoma manzoni. It is very frequent in children, adolescents, and young adults from endemic areas. The larvae develop into adult schistosoma swarms, which live in the blood vessels. And females release eggs that can become trapped in body tissues, triggering immune reactions, especially granulomas, as you can see here, that surround the, the, the eggs. It is uh, sometimes it is um, accompanied by hepatomegaly in 25% of cases. And um, the, the spinal form uh, the most frequent is the most most frequent a complication uh, in the central nervous system, especially the, the localization at the level of the conus medullary and coda equina. Remember that snails are important in the transmission. They are intermediate hosts. And, and here you have the life cycle of this parasite. Here you have two cases. Um, this is a 15-year-old boy with immunosuppression and a thoracic skin rash and right-sided lower limb paresis. Uh, you can see here the rash uh, and this uh, eccentric lesion on the right side of the conus medullaris with enhancement of both the ventral and dorsal roots. This is a five-year-old girl with bilateral brachial paresis, and you can see here the lesion at the ventral aspect of the spinal cord with enhancement of, the, uh, of both anterior horns of the um, spinal cord with a typical owl eyes pattern. And this was varicella zoster myelopathy, and this was D68 enterovirus myelopathy. So, they are both infectious disorders, and we have to be aware of this. Uh, we had uh, an epidemic of this enterovirus two years ago in Argentina. Again, two interesting cases um, with a slow progressive spastic paraparesis. Uh, we thought about uh, hereditary or metabolic etiology. Um, on the left, we have a 20 year old. Uh, man with this large uh, and longitudinally extended myelopathy. On axial images, you can see this inverted V sign uh, with, with compromise of the posterior columns. And on the right, this is a 60-year-old man with this uh, thin spinal cord, atrophic spinal cord with some hyperintensities at the level of the lateral columns. This was a case of HIV-associated vascular myelopathy, and this was a case of HTLV-1, which is a virus that caused the so-called uh, tropical spastic paraparesis, which is very frequent in some areas of the Caribbean region. And with this, I would like to conclude 
Um, there are endemic areas, but bats can travel with us. On imaging, some features may help, but most of them have an inspecific inflammatory pattern. Hyper eosinophilia is a good clue for parasites. Do the appropriate serological and liquid tests, but oftentimes a biopsy is required. Thank you very much for your attention.